Good evening and welcome to this evening's BSP webinar. My name is Imogen Midwood and I will be your host this evening. Our guest speaker is Professor Ian Chappell and he will be speaking tonight about non-plaque induced gingival lesions and conditions, systemic diseases and conditions that manifest in periodontal tissues, periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic diseases. The running time of the webinar this evening will be around one hour and 15 minutes and there will be opportunities to ask questions at the end. You can post your questions on via the question tab of the webinar pop-up, or you are, I, at, towards the end of the presentation, I will be able to pass the microphone over to you so that you can speak to Prof Professor Chapel yourself. Professor Chapel needs very little by way of an introduction within our society. If I was to sit here reading his CV this evening, I don't think we probably would make the end of the webinar. But just to name a couple of things he's done, he is head of the um, dental school at the University of Birmingham. He has recently won a, an award through the IADR, the International Association of Dental Research, which was the Distinguished Scientist Award. He has been asked next week to give his key, next month to go head over to Vancouver to give his keynote address. From my perspective, as a specialist trainee, he works tirelessly and he is a great inspiration to us through his research. He's always developing you know, research within um, periodontology and also through his teaching, he is passing on and inspiring to the next generation of students and periodontists. Before I hand over to Prof Chapel, I would like to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, Johnson & Johnson, the makers of Listerine. And regarding new upcoming BSP events, on the 14th of June, we will be celebrating the BSP's 70th anniversary by having some lectures in the afternoon, followed by a dinner in the Houses of Parliament. And the next web webinar will be by Manoj Tank, and he will be giving a practitioner's guide to managing your perio patients within the new classification. And we really hope you would be able to attend for either of both of these. And now, with no further ado, I will pass over to Prof Chapel. Um, I hope you enjoy listening to our webinar this evening. Thank you, Emmy. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you this evening. Uh, Imogen's given you the title. It's, it's quite a long title, really. I'm going to simplify it. And I'm just going to call it um, periodontal medicine, because in the UK, really, periodontal medicine is about all medicine. Uh, as it, and as lesions and conditions really present in the gingival and periodontal tissues. Um, so basically, as a refresher, you're obviously familiar with the workshop classification that took place in uh, 2017. And I'm going to speak on three main areas tonight. I'm going to speak on the non-plaque induced gingival conditions, uh, periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic diseases, and systemic diseases and conditions that affect the periodontal tissues because these two are quite different. Um, and I'm going to take a different approach to this. I don't want to just put up a great long list and talk about one after, after another. Uh, I want to make it practically relevant to you. Um, so if we go to the, the publication itself, I'm going to be discussing this group of conditions from work group one. And then from work group three, I'll be discussing uh, the manifestations of systemic diseases um, that affect the periodontal attachment apparatus and um, essentially periodontitis as a manifestation of, of systemic diseases. So um, within the classification summary that I put up in the uh, last webinar, uh, where I sort of made it really quite simple and, and pointed out the 10 broad groups, as you can see here, some of them I've whited out, the non-plaque-induced gingival uh, diseases and conditions, there are essentially eight categories as listed here. Periodontitis is a manifestation of systemic disease. There are a number of these. I'm going to largely focus on the ones listed here. And then when it comes to systemic diseases and conditions affecting the periodontal tissues, there's a great long list. Um, and I'm going to make this a very clinical presentation and try to make it as, as visually illustrative as possible so that it's practically uh, uh, useful. Um, so I like to talk about the periodontium as a window on the body because actually it is the periodontal, uh, the discipline of periodontology is, is a very biological discipline. 
and we focus on the surgical aspects really. Uh, that's predominantly how we're trained as dentists is we see something and we look at it with a view to what we're going to do operationally to manage it. But actually the medical uh, side of things is equally as reflective of the, the, the tremendous breadth of biological base to perio. And it often is, I think, undertaught um, within specialist training programs. And so um, in Chinese, that means the periodontal tissue is a window on the body. And the, the, the image here is a, is a textbook that I did back in, oh gosh, a long time ago, probably 2004, I think, with a colleague of mine, uh, John Hamburger. And, and it, it's basically a book in which we took chapter by chapter how lesions may present in the mouth and then guided the reader through um, arriving at a differential and, and a definitive diagnosis. And it wasn't really meant to be a comprehensive compendium. Um, and, I, and when I was preparing this presentation, I sort of went through the index and had a look in the back and, and counted up over 300 non-plaque induced conditions. Um, and then, you know, as you do on a Friday night with a large glass of wine, I, I decided to, uh, to sort of jot down the number of conditions that I felt could be diagnosed from the periodontal tissues. And I stopped at a thousand. So it's, it's a huge uh, area and, and one that's very, very under taught in my view in, in perio. So I have to give you some aims and learning outcomes to be modern. So here they are. Um, the main aim is to illustrate the tremendous breadth and range of non-plaque induced conditions that um, really go way beyond the 2017 classification system. It's, it's hopelessly inadequate in terms of the numbers of conditions that are there, and it's not meant to be a comprehensive guide in that regard. It's purely and simply a classification so that you can sort of pigeonhole and box things up because it makes it easier to remember. Um, but I'm gonna take you through a diagnostic algorithm um, that you will use every day in your day-to-day -day practice. And I'm, I'm gonna do that from the point of view of, of periodontal medicine, because the approach is different to um, a surgical approach. So I'll summarize the classification. Uh, I'll talk about practical implementation using that algorithm. A um, Couple of slides on special investigations for those of you that are particularly interested in taking this a little bit further, um, particularly if you're in hospital practice, but you can also do it in, 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 in specialist practice. Um, and that will lead us to arriving at a differential diagnosis. So um, that's the plan, scope of the field, uh, the 2017 classification, um, then establishing a differential diagnosis, uh, clinical investigations, lots of examples of diseases, lesions and conditions, some of which are common, some of which are less common, uh, and then we'll finish off with some conclusions. So. This is a slide that I show my first year students in Birmingham when I give them their first lecture on perio. And, and I put this slide up really to make the point that if they're going to practice the full scope of periodontology, then they need to have a working knowledge of all of these disciplines and probably a lot more. You need to know your anatomy. You need to know your genetics. You need to know your clinical chemistry. You need to know drugs, their side effects, uh, their, their interactions. You need a working knowledge of medicine, surgery, uh, behavioral science, ethics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the cases I'm going to go through to illustrate today, um, one of those disciplines or more will essentially be represented in those cases. So hopefully you, you'll appreciate that that slide isn't, um, isn't me being flippant. I actually mean it when I say to the first years, you need to know that. So... Um, Non-plaque induced periodontal diseases. Um, I said that, that we practice surgically because we are a surgical discipline and, and that's why many of us do this because we enjoy the surgery, but actually the medical model is very different to the surgical model. The medical model is all about getting to a diagnosis. But once you've got there, the treatment's pretty straightforward. You prescribe a drug or a behavioral intervention um, and that's it, job done. But the time, is spent trying to get to the diagnosis rather than the time being spent on the treatment. And in the Oxford Dif Dictionary, that is a definition of the science and practice uh, of medicine, um, or the discipline of medicine, sorry. It's the science and practice of the treatment and prevention of disease. And I emphasize treatment and prevention. 
The practice of medicine is uh, very much about treating or curing a person by means of using medicines. That's a fairly narrow definition. Um, I think we would include today um, counselling, uh, behaviour change, etc., within that definition. And then when you look at the definition of medicines within the Oxford Dictionary, drugs are perhaps taken by mouth in order to treat or prevent disease. Well, you can take drugs or administer them through other um, bodily orifices than the mouth. And, uh, I'm sure you can imagine what I'm talking about there. So it's again, it's a fairly narrow definition of what medicines are. Um, so let's have a look then at the non-plaque-induced gingival diseases and conditions. That is a list of the major categories. Uh, genetic and developmental infections, inflammatory, immune, reactive processes, neoplasms, and then metabolic and endocrine uh, uh, conditions, traumatic lesions, and then pigmentation. Um, and this is the paper, the consensus paper from group one, which was uh, the group that, that I chaired with Brian Mealy. And you can see here a little bit more detail about some of these conditions. And I'm going to talk you through things like plasma cell, gingivitis, erythema, multiforme, pemphigus, pemphigoid, uh, lupus, et cetera, et cetera, but in a very practical way. Um, and then when we look at um, group three, there are the systemic uh, disorders that uh, essentially have a major impact on the periodontal tissues by influencing periodontal inflammation. In other words, you've already got a periodontal inflammatory condition, um, but actually the systemic disorder, disorders impact on that. You then have the other systemic disorders influencing the pathogenesis of periodontal inflammation, which would be things like obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, osteoporosis, etc. I'm not going to talk about these, um, but I am going to talk also about the systemic disorders uh, that cause loss of periodontal tissues that are independent of periodontitis. Okay, and they're all sort of listed here in, in the table. This is a table from the Jepson paper, page 222 of the classification from group three. So we'll talk a little bit about some of these conditions, but again, in a very practical way that hopefully uh, you can apply in practice. So periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease, the obvious ones that come to mind are papillon Lefebvre syndrome or PLS, Hayne monk syndrome, uh, the leukocyte adhesion deficiencies, Downs, Shediak Agashi and Ehlers Danlos. And when it comes to the systemic diseases that affect the periodontal tissues, as I say, there are many of these ranging from hyperphosphatasia, histiocytosis X. Um, Wegener's granulomatosis is now called granulomatosis with polyangitis. Uh, don't, don't ask me why, but it's the same, it's the same condition. And then there are the neoplasms and the giant cell granulomas. Again, these are just some examples. The list is, is quite long. Now, one of the problems that I had with the 1999 classification was that it only had one group and it was periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. And in fact, most of the things that were listed in that group were not periodontitis. So neutropenia was listed. This is um, an example of a patient who has uh, neutropenia, a benign familial neutropenia, and they present with gingival ulceration. They don't present with periodontitis, that's not periodontitis. This patient is, um, uh, I forget, I think there were five or six at the time, and you can see they've lost their lower deciduous incisors. No, in fact, this patient was three at the time. Lower incisors are developing down here. They lost their primary dentition very, very early on, uh, and the teeth literally fell out um, with their roots intact, as you can see here. Uh, this is a tooth that's been sectioned to show a large pulp chamber. And, and this is hypophosphatasia. This is not periodontitis. With hypophosphatasia, there's a deficiency of alkaline phosphatase, which is the mineralizing enzyme. And what really happens is the cementum layer doesn't form on the tooth. So there's no uh, connective tissue attachment from the root surface to the bone, and the teeth therefore fall out. Um, and there's different forms of hypophosphatasia. Uh, this was a childhood form. Um, the adult form can affect the permanent dentition and teeth can be lost that way, but it's not really a true periodontitis. And I generally ask when I show this image what's unusual about it. This is a 15-year-old male. Uh, apologies, the x-ray is a bit fuzzy. I've, I've had to scan it and blow it up. 
Um, but, but really what's unusual here is that you don't have bone loss on the first molars. This is not what we would have called in the old days aggressive periodontitis or LJP or molar incisor as we call it now. It's largely affecting the five. Um, and this in fact is histiocytosis X. There was an associated soft tissue swelling and the only way you're gonna uh, diagnose that is by biopsying it and also taking some bone and doing a bone biopsy. It's not periodontitis. It looks like it, but it isn't. And the management is completely different. These patients need to go on cytotoxic drugs because there's central bone involvement, often affecting their lower limbs as well. So this is your diagnostic algorithm with the exception of perhaps taking a sexual history. You pretty well do this, I would imagine, on every patient that you see in practice. I certainly do um, in my hospital practice. But I'm gonna take you through it in a slightly different way. I'm gonna take you through it uh, from the perspective of trying to identify a medical condition or a systemic disease. If I stop occasionally because I'm, slip, I'm sipping my tea. Um, so the complaint is um, really important. This is the first clue you're gonna get as to what may be going on in the patient's mouth. Um, and quite often you can make the diagnosis from the complaint without ever having to even examine the patient. I'm not suggesting you wouldn't examine the patient, you would, but you'll have the diagnosis and your examination will simply be confirming that diagnosis. So an example would be a complaint of pain or soreness. Gingivitis is not normally painful. Uh, periodontitis is not painful. And so this would tend to indicate that you were dealing with an ulcerative or an erosive condition. And it's just a case of which one you're dealing with. And I'll come back to this patient later, but this looks like an atypical form of NUG. Patient has exposed bone, uh, they have superficial ulceration, um, and it's painful. It's therefore not gingivitis. It's something a little bit different to that. This patient has um, what we would call necrotizing ulcerative stomatitis. Uh, this patient had AIDS. Uh, you can see that the ulceration extends more than 10 millimeters from the gingival margin. So that would be a necrotizing ulcerative uh, stomatitis by definition. It's painful. They've got exposed bone. Uh, the tissues are necrotic. Management is complicated in a case like this. You would, I would recommend you refer cases like this, to be honest. This patient, again, complained of pain. Um, some people often say, well, it looks like an NUG. It doesn't look like an NUG because in fact the ulceration is marginal. It's not punched out into dental papillae. There's some inflammation here. The papillae are involved, but they're secondarily involved uh, compared to these sort of shallow serpiginous ulcers of the gingival uh, margins. And these are ragged in nature and they've got a sort of a yellowish base. Uh, and what you're looking at there is gingival herpes simplex uh, in this patient, but painful. And then this patient uh, again complains of pain. And this is where your anatomy is really important because the mucogingival line is a bit odd. It dives here up and down. It sort of follows this track and dives down here and then dives down here. Uh, there's very little attached gingivae and then it comes back up here. And the reason that's relevant is because this ulceration is not involving the gingivae. It's above the mucogingival line. So there's gingival sparing. And gingival sparing is fairly typical of a condition called erythema multiforme, which I'll come back to later. And, and erythema multiforme or EM is, is not an infectious condition. It's a type of a hypersensitivity reaction to either a drug or to a previous uh, viral infection. But the gingival sparing is important here in helping you arrive at your diagnosis. So after the complaint comes the history of the complaint and this to me is often pretty critical uh, to getting your diagnosis right. And you need to adopt a really forensic approach to your questioning. And so just one example of that would be the temporal relationship between the onset of a patient's signs uh, or symptoms of their condition. And when, for example, they may have started taking a particular drug. So, Another case of erythema multiforme, where you have these sort of shallow eroded areas affecting the, the lip. Um, there's always a story behind these cases. This was a 13-year-old lad who was dragged into my surgery by his father 
who literally pulled him in by his ear. Um, and the reason for that was that obviously quite often with erythema multiforme, you get sort of bleeding crusted lips and you also get ulceration of the genitals. And so dad clearly thought that little Johnny had been um, up to no good and picked up a sexually transmitted <laughs> infection. And, uh, you know, when I pointed out that actually, you know, little Johnny had an allergic reaction to the tetracycline he'd been put on a few months ago for, for his acne, um, little Johnny's face lit up and you could see his eyes had written all over them payback time. So dad was going to have to buy him a new mobile or something similar to that. But um, the key thing here is he had no lymphadenopathy. So um, he clearly didn't have any um, evidence of infection. And this tied in pretty well with him starting um, his tetracycline. Clearly the management is medical management. So liaison with his GP, get him off the tetracycline, let the acne come back, but this clears up and you've then uh, pretty well got your diagnosis and he can start on a different form of medication. And he also had these target lesions. So with erythema multiforme, you get these, they're said to look like a little bit of a, a dark board. You get concentric circles on the, this is the skin of the palm of the hand. These little uh, red rings uh, are not present in every case, but they are in, uh, in a number of cases. An example of a pigmented lesion. So um, this is a young girl who's got a Coca-Cola drinking habit and probably the tooth erosion is a lot worse than this. This is a slaty gray pigment. It's called an ethylis. E-P-H-Y-L-I-S, it's a, it's a gingival freckle. They can occur naturally, but in her case, it had appeared uh, a few months after starting uh, one of the old fashioned oral contraceptive pills. Um, and the oral contraceptive is associated with mucosal pigmentation. Different type of gingival pigmentation. This patient was taking AZT, uh, which was the first of the antiretrovirals, the uh, uh, nucleoside analog drugs that really started saving lives. And uh, that's caused this type of nodular appearance to the gingivae and the, um, and the pigmentation. And if you look at her fingernails, um, there's a kind of a striated pattern. She's an Afro-Caribbean patient, but as the drug levels sort of peak and trough, you can get uh, striations in the pigmentation appearing, particularly in the nail beds. And this poor girl, again, a young patient, 16, uh, the, the slide doesn't really do this justice, but she literally had purple gingivae. And she'd been taking minocycline for management, uh, again, of juvenile acne, and it can cause this type of pigmentation. Um, and all you can really do in a situation like this is, um, is reassure her and tell her not to smile too broadly when she's at the nightclub under the UV lights, because it really does fluoresce when, uh, when, when she did that. Different example of temporality here, uh, but important. So this patient su suffered from systemic lupus. Uh, and so the SLE is presenting here as a disquamative gingivitis, a fairly classic disquamative gingivitis. But that wasn't her complaint. Her complaint was of severe pain in the palate. Um, and so when you look in the palate, she's got this huge erosion with exposed palatal bone here. Um, and this actually started to appear um, a few weeks after she started taking a drug called hydroxychloroquine, which is frequently used in the management of lupus um, and does have some pretty unpleasant side effects. So in her case, again, this is medical management that's required. And it's a case of talking to her rheumatologist and uh, getting her off the hydroxychloroquine uh, to manage that and onto a different drug. Now, this is really important in terms of uh, an example of why you should never treat medical problems surgically. Um, this patient was referred to me by one of my old bosses when I was in training, and, and the request was to do a, a connective tissue graft here. Apart from the erupting canine, um, there's no way that I was going to touch this patient with any kind of surgery, because if you look really carefully at the tissues, this is white scar tissue up here. And you don't want to be putting a knife into white scar tissue unless you know why that scar tissue is there. And so um, in this particular case, um, I spent about 18 months trying to get to a diagnosis. And that's the key thing with medical issues, provided it's not a malignancy. Um, don't worry about how long it takes you to get there. Explore every avenue um, rather than dive in and do something surgical because you could regret it. And uh, I tried every blood test under the sun. 
Um, she was biopsied. Um, we couldn't really discover what was going on until one day, and it was a windy day, she came into the surgery with her hair blown back, and you can see this midline scar here. Uh, and that gave us the diagnosis, really. This is a condition called morphia, linear morphia, which is a localized form of um, lupus, uh, sorry, not lupus, scleroderma. It, it doesn't have the systemic consequences, so it's not a systemic sclerosis. Um, the French call it the coup de sabre. You end up with what looks like a cut of the sword down, quite often down the midline of the face. And this is very, very avascular. Um, now, she'd been to see one of her maxillofacial, uh, one of the maxillofacial surgeons, not in our place, I would hesitate to add, because they wouldn't have done this. And they'd done a lip revision for what was at the time a very small notch. And because they hadn't bothered to do the medical work up and get a diagnosis, she ended up with quite uh, an unpleasant and unesthetic and disfiguring notch because she didn't heal, because you don't manage medical conditions surgically. So um, in her case, once we had the diagnosis, I was able to send her to our MaxFax team here and, 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 and give them the diagnosis. And they used fat injections to plump out the lip. And uh, we didn't treat the recession surgically at all. She had a low lip line and we managed it conservatively just with good old bog standard perio treatment uh, and a gingival veneer and, uh, and she was very happy with that outcome. So after the history of the complaint um, you will then do your medical history and quite often the medical history will probably give you a diagnosis for whatever the lesion is that you're looking at in that patient's mouth. So I've listed here some examples. They may have a vesicular bullous disease, they may have sarcoidosis, systemic sclerosis, whatever. And I'll show you examples of these um, and how they present gingivally. Um, but the key thing is, it's a little bit like the old BSP oak tree. You follow a line of questioning um, and you follow that oak tree until you uh, either get your diagnosis or if you don't, you come back to the main trunk of questions and then carry on down a, a different branch. And if you do that, you'll probably get there or thereabouts at the end. So this um, elderly gentleman um, suffers from cicatricial pemphigoid. We call it benign mucous membrane pemphigoid now. He had the diagnosis in his medical history. It used to be called cicatricial because you get this scarring. As you can see, he's got ocular scarring. So the disquamative gingivitis was due to his pemphigoid. This young girl has pemphigus, um, and so she's presenting with um, unusually an intact bulla on her hand. But again, she has oral and gingival manifestations uh, of her pemphigus and uh, therefore she needs referral to a dermatologist and probably also to your oral medicine team if you're not happy to manage it yourself. You can generally manage the discarment of gingivitis yourself without too much difficulty but um, it's the, the impact of the pemphigus on other organs of the body, kidney, etc. that you need to think about getting a referral for. And similarly with the pemphigoid, worth getting an ophthalmology opinion if the patient hadn't already had one, because you, you need to think about the, uh, the eyes and uh, protecting the eyes. This patient has dystrophic nail changes associated with lichen planus. Uh, I'm sure you can all diagnose lichen planus, provided it doesn't present atypically. Um, and sometimes uh, it's important to ask your patient to just roll their their trouser leg up or just raise their um, their skirt or whatever just to the knee so you can examine the, the, the shins and the forearms and they, they often have these purple pruritic patches, they're kind of itchy patches, uh, look a bit scabby, uh, they can be quite small and about 60% of lichen planus patients will have these and the reason it's useful to, to find them if you can is that it just avoids the need for a biopsy. If they've got or what looks like oral lichen planus or discriminative gingivitis, and they've got these lesions on their shins or, or forearms, then you've pretty well got your diagnosis and you can move to, to therapeutic management. Um, I think the other thing that's important with periodontal medicine is never to believe what you read in textbooks because they're often full of rubbish. Um, and this patient, if I tell you, they have a C, a D, an E, and this is their six just erupting, you'll probably work out they're around about five or six years of age. Her complaint was that she had sore painful gums and she has erosive lichen planus, as you can see here. She has a discriminative gingivitis, she's only five years of age um, and fortunately uh, she matured out of this. 
but I, it's not supposed to present obviously in this kind of age group it's supposed to be people in their sort of mid to late 50s or older uh, with a, a two to one predominance for females over males for some reason um, but it can occur in kids it's not unheard of different situation here I had the diagnosis here thank goodness this patient uh, already had a diagnosis of sarcoidosis and in fact the key thing here is that this sort of erythema and swelling pro progresses way beyond the mucogingival line and up into the sulcus and when you have this full uh, thickness you, you, uh, a redness you know you're not dealing with the plaque induced condition here um, and so you need to biopsy and you should always biopsy away from the ginger bee always biopsy uh, the reflective mucosa as high up as you can get it uh, for reasons I'll come on to later but basically gingival biopsies will show inflammation because everybody has plaque in their mouths and everybody has histological inflammation in their mouths um, and you will mask the true uh, pathology if you biopsy the ginger bee so most oral pathologists will tell you that a, a gingival biopsy is a bit of a waste of time really um, go above the uh, ginger bee and biopsy a non-gingival site and in, in sarcoidosis you have to go deep because the granulomas are close to uh, bone they're deep within the connective tissue and that's what you're looking for of the granulomas um, and a case of um, this patient already had a history of celiacs and uh, they have some gingival ulceration here that's pretty non-specific but most likely related to their to their celiacs and I wish you could hear you guys, but um, if I asked you for a differential diagnosis here, I'm sure you'd all say, ah, it's Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And it is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, where they have this sort of hyperelasticity of their skin. Um, and of course, types four and eight, and occasionally type one, uh, but mainly types four and eight, do present with a very destructive periodontitis. This patient actually had type three. They had no periodontitis. You still would probe them to check for that, but I was able to reassure the very switched on general dental practitioner who referred this patient in because they couldn't find any periodontitis and they thought, hang on, they must have it, this is Ehlers Danlos. And I was able to reassure them they didn't have it uh, and get the patient to do their party trick for the, for the camera, which is always useful for this type of presentation. And then uh, I'll come back to this. This is a four year old with um, very rough uh, hyperkeratotic palms to their hands, obviously has Papillon Fev syndrome but it could be hay monk syndrome or it could just be palmer plantar keratoderma uh, they do look the same okay so after your medical history you would take a drug history and in terms of drugs there are obviously prescription drugs and there are recreational drugs and prescription drugs can produce signs and symptoms in the gingival and periodontal tissues when they're being used correctly. I've shown you examples of erythema multiforme, for example, and some ulceration and pigmentation. You can get a trigeminal nerve neuropathy with certain drugs, and in particular, the antiretrovirals used for managing HIV disease, uh, drugs like AZT, can cause a very painful uh, trigeminal nerve neuropathy, and it, uh, it, it can present uh, normally it's perif a peripheral neuropathy affecting their feet and, uh, and, and calves but it can present in, in the face or obviously prescription drugs can be misused and cause side effects as a result of being misused and I guess by definition recreational drugs are being misused because we're not supposed to use them apart from the cannabinoids in some parts of the country and world um, I don't need to tell you what this is. This is a drug-induced gingival overgrowth. This patient was taking phenytoin. And I think it's probably fair to say that, you know, traditionally we'd love to take a scalp to this, wouldn't we? But remember, you shouldn't treat medical problems surgically. You should treat them medically. So the first thing to do is to clean the patient up and see if you can substitute the drug. Uh, and you will, you will generally succeed in drug substitution for cyclosporin because tacrolimus is a, a viable and cheap alternative now. Didn't used to be, but it is now to cyclosporin. And you can probably also um, substitute calcium channel blockers because there's plenty of other uh, drugs available. GPs and cardiologists love using calcium channel blockers because they're very effective in the management of hypertension. Um, but actually they have some unpleasant side effects. The one group you might struggle with are the, epileptic, the epileptics because of the impact, of course, on their life if they have a fit when they're being weaned off the drugs 
then it can stop them driving for a year. So the, uh, the neurologists are often um, a little bit resistant to drug substitution. Um, my experience with phenytoin is if you treat it non-surgically, do your surgery, get really optimal pap control, it tends not to come back. So um, this might require a mixture of medical and uh, surgical treatment. Um, just another case, uh, pre-surgery uh, pre and um, clearly an inflammatory component to this one. This patient's taking uh, amlodipine. This needs to be managed uh, medically, but also we need to give the patient some behavior change, plaque control and clean them up. Different situation here, um, oral contraceptive involved here. I have to say the modern oral contraceptives don't tend to produce these side effects because um, they tend to be low in, in estradiol. Um, and so generally this is, uh, this is not so much of a problem. Now, this is also a drug-induced condition. This patient uh, is a heroin addict and um, is using methadone, which um, I'm reliably told tastes like the proverbial and so it's laced with sugar uh, to make it more palatable. He doesn't brush his teeth, um, never brushes his teeth, hence he has gross caries uh, from the sugar and the, um, and the plaque buildup. Um, but I often use this guy as an example of somebody who is resistant to periodontitis because he basically um, has no bone loss and no attachment loss and he never brushes his teeth and he's 48 years of age. So he's one of that sort of 10 to 15% that are never gonna develop periodontitis, but it's nevertheless, it is a drug effect. I'm sure you've seen this before, or if you haven't, you'll have seen it in textbooks. This is an aspirin burn. Uh, patient has an abscess, periodontal abscess. So they've sucked an aspirin, mistakenly believing that uh, it's gonna help their pain. It does help the pain because it causes so much sloughing and burning that they forget about the abscess pain, um, but it's not really um, the right way of taking aspirin. Um, and this one's very interesting. Again, I, I, I would normally, this is a 15 year old girl, a uh, difficult one to interview because mum was in the surgery at the time, um, but it, it kind of looks like an NUP uh, if you look at it very carefully. She's got sort of missing interdental papillae, classic appearance, uh, but what's not classic is this is her at presentation. So she has superb plaque control um, and she's a non-smoker. And so I had to ask mum to leave the room while we explored uh, her recreational drug habits. And uh, sure enough, she rubs cocaine into her gingival tissues. Um, and that can cause an avascular necrosis and this type of breakdown. Um, when mum came in back into the room, we, we'd agreed that I was just exploring whether she was a smoker or not. And uh, we didn't want to ask those questions in front of mum. And I could honestly say that she wasn't a smoker. And so mum relaxed a little bit. Um, she shouldn't have relaxed, given the history. Anyhow, so the social history is important. Um, you're all familiar with smoking. Uh, this little, little chap is two years of age. Those are the streets of Shanghai. It does happen uh, at that level. But also stress is becoming more and more important. It does produce clinical manifestations, and I'll show you the pathways and why that happens. But we also need to think now these days about alcohol intake. That can be associated with um, liver problems, uh, obviously liver disease due to alcoholism will cause you problems if you're doing surgery. You can end up with very low platelet levels, thrombocytopenic patients will bleed. But also um, liver disease can uh, result from primary biliary cirrhosis, which is actually associated with lichen planus, um, coincidentally. And then they may have unusual sports uh, or unusual habits that we need to know about. So. This is a girl, uh, 15 at presentation, very withdrawn girl, about six foot three. Um, parents came in and, and really made fun of her throughout the consultation. And she had these sort of granular ulcerated areas to her gingival tissues that were a little bit odd. Um, they got worse as time progressed. Um, I biopsied her on five different occasions over a two and a half year period. Uh, she had all kinds of blood investigations done because this looked really quite unpleasant. It looked like she might have some kind of leukemia or some kind of giant cell uh, uh, tumor going on here, but uh, everything came back normal. Um, she even had an endoscopy uh, because one of the biopsies showed a granuloma and I wondered whether she did in fact have 
sarcoidosis or whether in fact she had celiacs. Um, but in fact, the endoscopy showed nothing of any significance. And then one day um, I was chatting to her because she'd hit 18 and was um, a little bit more communicative and her parents weren't in the surgery. And I noticed that she was she had bitten fingernails and the skin around her nail beds was fairly ragged and unpleasant and she had warts on her fingers. And um, so it came down to um, these being an unusual presentation of viral warts uh, and a bit of cryosurgery to her fingers uh, resulted in, in almost total resolution of the gingival lesions. But again, it would have been very easy to dive in and do surgery. Um, and I wasn't particularly concerned because the bloods were normal, uh, but it was taking so long to get to a diagnosis. We just needed to get there before we did anything stupid. So how does stress affect? Um, don't worry, this is the only academic slide I'm gonna show you. It's just really to make the point that, that we do understand the biological pathways through which stress does uh, impact upon particularly uh, lesions of the skin, but also gingival conditions. Um, and one axis is, is around complement activation. And complement is activated, um, as you know, by C1 esterase. And C1 esterase inhibitor is the counterbalance that, that switches off the activation of complement. But complement is also activated through the classical pathway, if you've got antigen antibody um, complexes, uh, but it can also be activated by endotoxin through factor 12, plasmin, uh, and activation that way. Now, what happens when we get stressed is that um, the brain releases corticotrophin releasing ho hormone from the hypothalamus, and that stimulates the pituitary to release uh, a chemical called beta endorphin, and that can activate complement um, itself. But the pituitary will also produce ACTH. And the ACTH uh, will uh, act on the periodontal inflammatory and immune cells through the NF-kappa B pathway to give rise to pro-inflammatory cytokine release. So, for example, interleukin-1, which can feed back and then further increase S-protein binding and complement activation. And so all of that really cranks up our inflammatory response and you can end up with bone resorption, really induced by the inflammation and not the plaque per se. And I'll show you what I mean by that, because it's, it, it's quite important. And you can also get a significant gingival edema uh, that, that can result uh, from that process. And um, ultimately, the plasmin will activate the fibrinolysis, uh, and that can activate the gingival edema. And the IL-1 will also feed back positively to the hypothalamus and again, uh, accentuate this process. So stress, a lot of biological pathways here, and stress can cause significant inflammation and bone loss. And this is a lady I'm going to come back to towards the end uh, when I talk about inflammatory conditions, who is suffering from a condition called C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency or angioedema. So she's deficient in the inhibitor that switches off complement activation. And so every time she gets stressed, her gingival tissues swell up with fluid. Do you want to operate on this? Um, no, because it's very difficult. These, these are very boggy and, and it just moves around when you're trying to operate on it. Uh, I had to operate on her 47 times over a period of 27 years. Um, and eventually we lost her teeth, but we managed to keep them for nearly 30 years. Uh, but I'll come back to her uh, later. Uh, again, important that you get the medical diagnosis right, because actually management should be medical, not surgical. In her case, I had to do surgery. Um, Okay, so after the um, after the um, the drug history, you would then hopefully take a diet history very briefly and very quickly. Uh, this was the lad I showed you at the beginning. It's important to recognise that iron is important for epithelial maturation, and so where you have an iron deficiency, anemia, quite often the epithelium is fairly immature and will break down quite easily and give rise to mouth ulcers. You'll be familiar with that from your undergrad days. Now, one of the first things you check for are the hematinics to find out if the patient's iron deficient. And if they are, is it a microcytic uh, or, a, or a macrocytic anemia? Uh, because if it's macrocytic, it might be due to, um, I don't know, something like pernicious anemia. They might have a B12 deficiency. So you would then look for B12 deficiency. But basically, um, diet can be associated with erosive disease. 
certain micronutrient deficiencies can cause it. This was the lad I showed you earlier on uh, with what looked like an atypical NUG. Um, he actually didn't respond to metronidazole, uh, didn't respond to a broader spectrum antibiotic penicillin because I thought there may be secondary infection of these ulcers. And what eventually he responded to, believe it or not, was uh, vitamin C uh, supplementation because he was a student studying for finals living off beer and baked beans. And uh, this was a very atypical form of, uh, it wasn't really a new G, this is scurvy basically. This is, this is a patient, the modern day version of scurvy, where the epithelium is breaking down because vitamin C is important for collagen maturation um, and he's got exposed bone. And it won't surprise you to know that his presenting complaint was of pain. Um, and this is him two weeks after the vitamin C. You can see we've got re-epithelialization here. And we're almost there with the anterior gingivae, bit of residual sort of um, fib fibrinolytic type of appearance to the ulceration, but it's almost healed and the lower incisors have healed. So dietary suppl supplementation in this case, medical management to deal with his, his vitamin C deficiency. Um, this is quite common in the Midlands, particularly in Birmingham, um, but this was a 15 year old and actually I'm sure you won't mind me telling you Paul Weston, uh, who's one of our staff here now, one of our uh, newer consultants here, um, but at the time was a local specialist in Perio. Uh, Paul referred this girl to me because he'd assessed her and noticed quite astutely actually that the bone loss that she was presenting with didn't look normal, didn't look like aggressive periodontitis. She, um, she's Asian, had a poor diet, lived off chapatis, uh, not a great deal else. She was very underweight, looked anorexic, and she was wearing, if you like, full uh, body coverage, pretty much. She wasn't exactly in a, in a burqa, but she, she had her face exposed, but obviously didn't get a lot of UV light and a lot of daylight. And when I looked at her radiographs, as Paul had done, um, there was quite a bit of... Um, widening of the apical periodontal membrane space. These look like multiple periapical areas if you look carefully. Uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, loss of bone density and radiolucency. So a number of blood tests were performed on her to check her liver function, her kidney function. Um, we looked at alkaline phosphatase levels thinking that she might have some form of hyperphosphatasia which may explain the widening going on here. and Maybe the teeth are going to fall, fall out uh, as the earlier case I showed you. But actually, none of that was the case. Uh, and so I tested her vitamin D levels and she came back with a vitamin D level that was incredibly deficient, 16 nanomoles per litre. You'd normally be looking for levels over 50. So she's very vitamin D deficient. So for her, it was medical management um, and she was, I put her on vitamin D supplements for three months and lo and behold the bone remineralized really quite beautifully as you can see here uh, everything pretty well came back to normal um, so quite a dramatic outcome but not that unusual um, this is a different patient presenting this is an older lady but presenting again with radiolucencies around these look like um, an example of a condition we would call periapical peri cemental dysplasia um, but again, her um, vitamin D levels were extremely low. Um, and we actually published a series on this, uh, making the point that periapical cemental dysplasia, uh, which classically presents in Afro-Caribbean patients um, over the age of 50 when they're approaching or going through menopause. So they're a little bit osteoporotic, um, but they're not getting much daylight. We, we, we published a case series uh, really hypothesizing that periapical cemental dysplasia might actually just be vitamin D deficiency if you look at the demographic that it presents in. Um, whether that's true or not, I have no idea, but it was uh, it was published in the Journal of Perio and it was worth a punt. Okay, um, you probably don't routinely take a sexual history from your patients. There are some situations in which you really ought to do this. And, and I don't mean, you know, um, when was the last time you had it and was it good for you type of approach. I, I mean, you've got to be really, really sensitive, very professional and you have to have a high index of suspicion uh, to justify asking the questions. And uh, the way I tend to approach it is just by simply explaining to the patient that there are a number of different causes for what they may be presenting with. And one of them may be uh, a sexually transmitted infection. So, you know, do they have a regular partner? 
have they had unprotected sex in the last uh, six months or so because they may uh, be at risk of HIV, syphilis or chlamydia, which is highly prevalent, particularly in teenagers. Uh, we have quite a promiscuous generation Y, not Z really. Generation Y are those who are kind of in their late teens and early 20s now, I suppose. Um, and syphilis is by no means a disease of the past either in this country. Um, it still does present mainly to our oral medicine clinics. Um, so the examination really begins extra orally when the patient walks through the surgery door because with periodontal medicine you need to note things such as their skin. Are they puffing? Are they red in the face? Might they have hypertension? Do they have any obvious signs of an underlying systemic disease? Um, because all we really have to go on as, as dental surgeons is the clothed patient. We might see their hands, we might see their scalp, we might see um, you know, their shins, but not a great deal else. Um, and I show this image um, because it was drawn by a female uh, in a quintessence book that we published, a female artist, and I had to point out to the female artist that actually this was entirely non-PC uh, and she needed to redraw it in a different form. Um, the point we were trying to make was that in dentistry you examine the clothed patient and you need to go on uh, face, neck, hands um, and not a great deal else. So this young lad, um, seven years of age, raging temperature, uh, complaining of a very sore and painful mouth, had gingival erosions everywhere, a um, little bit of blood and crusting on his lips. Question was, was he presenting with herpes simplex or was he presenting with erythema multiforme because it looks the same but the difference is erythema multiforme, as I said earlier on, is a, a non-infectious condition. But when he turns sideways, you can see the lymphadenopathy. It's really quite prominent here. And so that, alongside uh, the gingival appearance of the what looked like a herpes infection, tells us he has erythema multiforme and uh, we're dealing with a drug related issue um, or allergy. This lady, believe it or not, is smiling very broadly. And so when she walks through the surgery door and is talking to you and you're cracking a joke and trying to make her relaxed and she's smiling, you don't see the smile. She's got a classic mask-like uh, facies that you, you would associate with systemic sclerosis, which is what she has. This patient looks like she has mumps, very large, prominent parotid glands. Her complaint is of an incredibly dry mouth. She um, goes to bed every night with about... Um, uh, I forget what it was, 20 glasses of water by her bedside table because uh, she wakes up every few minutes with her tongue stuck through her mouth. And she does have an incredibly dry mouth. What she has is HIV salivary gland disease, um, which is bad news for, for dry mouth, but it's actually good news for HIV because the, the glands here, the parotids, as you can see in this MRI scan, are destroyed by a CD8 lymphocytosis, not a CD4. Um, and the CD8 cells are very, very powerfully antiviral, particularly anti-HIV. What do you do in a case like this? Uh, well, you probably refer them, but if you're on the receiving end, um, it's worth knowing if there's any functioning glandular tissue in the mouth. And so this is a sort of a radioisotope scan showing, oh dear, the black thing should have disappeared. Can I get rid of it? No, sorry. Um, uh, basically, it shows that the parotid glands have no activity in them. These are the submandibular glands. There's not a lot of yellow there. There's a lot of yellow in the uh, in, in the thyroid glands, but basically she has no functioning glandular tissue. Uh, and so putting her on a parasympathomimetic drug like pilocarpine. So pilocarpine mm -hmm. is a drug that will stimulate saliva flow by activating the parasympathetic uh, system. Um, it's going to be pretty useless in her case because she has no functioning glandular tissue. This lady's lips walk through the surgery door really before she does. And when you see something like this, you know you're dealing with uh, either an angioedema, an allergic reaction, or you're dealing with one of the orofacial granulomatoses, something like Crohn's or, or sarcoidosis. Um, and this chap basically um, has warts uh, on his fingers. And the, the, this is just showing you that when the patient's lying back, check the, check the scalp out, he's got a wart on his scalp. And it may be the gingival lesion you're looking at is some kind of viral wart um, that has resulted from, um, if you like, um, digit to oral contact. It's not that uncommon. 
When it comes to the intraoral exam, um, I would always recommend that you ignore the presenting sign or the presenting symptoms. So if the patient's presenting with a lump on their upper left canine uh, gingival area, ignore it and examine the rest of the mouth first because actually you don't want to miss the squamous cell carcinoma in the floor of the mouth because you've been focusing on the cyst or the, uh, I don't know, the fibroma or the uh, fibrous epulis on their upper left three. So um, examine the mouth thoroughly, only takes 20 seconds, quick look under the tongue everywhere around to make sure you're not missing anything um, and then go back to the presenting complaint and consider the fact that the patient may have multiple pathology. So this lady had triple pathology. She's got an NUG, she's also got erosive lichen planus, and she's also got an inflammatory bowel condition called pyostomatitis. And so the way that I managed her was to clean her up, get her on metronidazole, and the NUG resolved. We were still then left with a fairly clear uh, erosive lichen planus. Um, and before we put her on the steroids, uh, she also had uh, suppurative type areas. Uh, we got an opinion from the gastroenterology people and they identified the pyostomatitis. So be very careful with the examination and uh, don't assume you're just dealing with one condition. On the rare occasion, uh, you might do, be dealing with multiple pathology. Um, so this chap, um, quite a sad case really, uh, he's, he was referred by a local dentist, a very, very switched on local dentist who'd done some very nice crown and bridge work as part of what was the MGDS exam at the time, presented on our undergraduate clinic with a red lesion. And the first thing to note here is that it extends beyond the mucogingival line. Okay, so it's not plaque induced. And yet it had been treated as a plaque induced lesion um, because actually there was bone loss when you probed you could feel the labial bone uh, had been, uh, was missing. And the GDP had diagnosed an abscess, which could go beyond the mucogingival line, I guess, and treated him with non-surgical debridement quite correctly. It hadn't resolved, so GDP had then treated with redebridement and systemic antibiotics, and it still hadn't resolved. And there was a bit of suppuration when, uh, or what looked like suppuration when he uh, came to see me. But in a situation like this, alarm bells should be ringing um, because you've got bone loss. And it's not typical, it's not interproximal, no interproximal bone loss, radiographs look normal, um, but actually probing revealed labial plate bone loss. So you biopsy. He comes back after the biopsy and um, it looks even worse. He's got what is clearly a fungating vascular tumor here. There's a satellite lesion across the midline now, and this is only a week after the biopsy. Um, the pathology report, is of a pyogenic granuloma, no evidence of malignancy. And uh, I learned a big lesson from this, and, and it's one to share with you guys, because actually um, many of you will probably appreciate this now, but, 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 it, but it was a big change after the Bristol uh, pathology scandals, uh, where what you'll get now from a histopathologist is a description of what they see down the microscope. They won't give you a diagnosis, because they're not the clinical uh, person seeing the patient, you are. And so you are expected to make the diagnosis based upon your clinical findings and based upon what you read on the pathology report, which can create a bit of a dilemma for you because this chap basically, um, I was told it was a, a benign lesion. So I rebiopsied him and that's him after the rebiopsy. We're clearly dealing with something very malignant here. The rebiopsy was also benign. Um, and what in fact he has uh, what he required was a sexual history to be taken, as I mentioned earlier. He was uh, a gay man, and when I asked him why he hadn't revealed that information when I first um, spoke to him, he said, well, I didn't want to admit that I might have AIDS. Uh, he did have AIDS, um, and he died 18 months later from a pulmonary Kaposi sarcoma, uh, the primary tumour being in his mouth. And what's really sad about this situation is his diagnosis was delayed by two weeks because of the need for me to re-biopsy um, and by the fact that he did reveal uh, when I took a sexual history that he was that he was high risk uh, individual for HIV disease. This was back in the 90s. Um, so um, this wouldn't happen today, but some important lessons in, in, in managing that case. The reason it wouldn't happen today is that 99% that of HIV positive patients will be put on antiretroviral therapy, 
the virus will be suppressed to undetectable levels in their blood and they'll be perfectly, they'll live a perfectly normal life expectancy. Um, thank goodness, but in those days that wasn't the case. Okay, clinical investigations. Um, I've only got a couple of slides on these because I don't want to bore you with them, but for those of you that are interested, um, hematology, routine hematology will give you um, a differential white cell count so you can think about leukemia and el eliminating that. It'll give you hematinics levels of iron, B12, folate, etc. A clinical chemistry screen will tell you about, you can ask for an HbA1c, uh, you can look at liver enzymes, uh, you can look at something called serum ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme. The reason you might want to look at ACE is that um, these, this is um, produced by granulomas in Crohn's disease and sarcoidosis. So if serum ACE levels are elevated, it can be an indication that you're dealing with one of the um, granulomatous inflammatory conditions. Serology, uh, you can just look for total levels of immunoglobulins, uh, IgA, GM, E, etc. E obviously would be an indication of an allergic reaction in an atopic patient, but you can also look at subclasses if necessary or look at complement levels if necessary. Um, and there are then semi-specific tests you can do. So if you, for example, think the patient might have an inflammatory bowel condition, then asking for anti-endomesial antibodies will give you an indication as to whether they do or not. This is becoming a little bit old fashioned because there are more specific uh, tests, serological tests you can do. Or if you suspect lupus, you might wanna look at anti-nuclear antibodies. And again, you can just tick the box on the form and request that. More specific would be um, uh, investigations, for example, for celiacs, you can look for anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies, which is what the T TG stands for. Anti-tissue transglutaminase is, is more specific to, um, to celiacs. If you're thinking that the patient may have um, pemphigus or pemphigoid, you can look for anti-epidermal antibodies. Uh, if you think it's pemphigus, then you would be looking for uh, antibodies to intercellular cement because the, the bully form within the epidermis, they're intra-epithelial. Or if you're thinking it might be pemphigoid, then you would look for basement membrane antibodies. And again, you can specifically request those. ROLAR, now called SSA and SSB and anti-centromere, these are uh, what are called antibodies to extractable nuclear antigens. And these you would look at in things like Sjogren's syndrome or again in lupus. Um, Sclera 70, as the name suggests, would be scleroderma. Um, and if you've got an anemic patient and it's a macrocytic anemia, you might want to look for um, uh, anti-gastric parietal cell or anti-intrinsic factor antibodies because they may have uh, pernicious anemia. And then there are more specific antibodies for lupus, uh, anti-Smith and double-stranded DNA, and what you would look at with lupus, for example. And ANCA, uh, which stands for anti-neutrophil uh, cytoplasmic uh, antibodies, that can be useless, 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 sorry, useful in diagnosing Crohn's uh, or in diagnosing um, uh, vagueness granulomatosis. So in vagueness, there's a specific uh, anchor called anchor uh, C, and in Crohn's, it would be anchor P, although actually there's a more specific antibody now called ASCA, which is anti uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody for those of you that are really uh, into your immunology, and, and that is, is far more specific to, uh, to Crohn's than, than ANCHOR is. Um, so that's just a brief run through some very specific serology or, or general blood tests. Um, if you suspect an infectious condition, you obviously might be thinking about culture and sensitivity. Uh, you might wish to biopsy, but if you're going to biopsy, remember, better to avoid gingivy and biopsy non gingival site. And if you get high levels of IgEs in your, in your initial serology, you might want to think about referring the patient for patch testing. I'll come back to that later with some examples of where you might want to do that. Um, the classic example would be um, plasma cell gingivitis, for example. And that would be done by a dermatologist or a clinical immunologist. And then it may well be that you want to um, refer your patient to a psychiatrist. Um, you think I'm joking, we, we do employ a liaison psychiatrist in the, in the dental hospital here in Birmingham. Uh, he does an entire afternoon every two weeks, and that's just for the staff. 
um, no, I'm joking. Uh, it's not just for the staff. It's for people that we feel have, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'll show you an example of that at the end. That's very, very relevant if you're thinking about doing connective tissue crafting. Um, but we'll come on to that at the end. And our, our liaison psychiatrist is actually a chair of psychiatry. And uh, he tells me reliably that, that the patients I send him are his worst ever nightmares. Um, as, as periodontists and, and dental surgeons, we often deal with a lot of psychiatric disease and we just get on and deal with it without really thinking uh, whether or not the patient does need referral. Beware the idiosyncrasies with these special investigations. So, for example, if you have an increased mean capacity of volume MCV, it could just mean the patient is on the oral contraceptive because it can have that side effect, or it may mean that they are hitting the alcohol because that can also increase your MCV. And positive anti-nuclear antibodies are common in people over the age of 50. Uh, so if the levels are just above the normal level, I wouldn't worry about it. It's probably just their age. Um, remember to use the correct reference ranges. Um, so if, for example, with hypophosphatasia, um, the alkaline phosphatase levels in children are generally much, much higher than in adults because they're obviously actively growing and going through bone growth and bone mineralization. So you'd be talking over 250 uh, upwards, whereas the reference range for, um, and that's international units per litre, um, the reference range for um, adults, I forget, is somewhere between 70 and 200, something like that, international units per litre. So you may, in fact, be told by your report that actually this is a normal level. A child may have, for example, 200 international units per litre. Per litre. That's not normal for a child, that's abnormal, and that would tend to indicate they may be suffering from a hypophosphatasia because they should be well over 250. Uh, and there are different tests you would do for that. I'd probably refer the patient to that point because you have to look for things like, oh God, uh, you need to do urine tests for um, uh, um, enzymes like uh, PLP and PPI. Uh, there are other enzymes that are actually broken down by alkaline phosphatase. And so if they're deficient in alkaline phosphatase, then the PPI levels would be raised. Uh, and the um, PLP levels in their urine will be raised, but those are not tests I'd recommend you would do in practice uh, unless you're really into taking the piss. I shouldn't be saying jokes like this because this is being recorded, but anyhow, it's the evening and I'm, I'm sure that uh, you're sat at home with a glass of wine. Um, I'm not. <laughs> I'm sitting here with a cup of water and a cup of tea. <laughs> Still at work, but what the heck. Uh, anyhow, I'm digressing. Um, so think of this cheaper blood tests first um think of serum folate because it's easy to do on a blood test rather than red cell folate if you're thinking of anemia that's more expensive and i've already mentioned if you're doing anti-nuclear antibodies you can get that cheaply from a routine serological test just tick the box uh, but if that comes back positive you might then want to think about if you're thinking it's lupus rather than a mixed connective tissue disease you might want to think about looking at double-stranded dna or the anti-Rho or the anti-Smith antibodies, as I mentioned earlier. And I, I think I've covered this, haven't I? Beware gingival biopsies, they're not a great deal of use. Okay, so last sort of, uh, I guess, 20 minutes or so. Um, what do you do when the patient's in the chair and you haven't got a clue what you're looking at? Um, um, in that case, go for a surgical sieve. Uh, don't be embarrassed to do it. I use a surgical sieve. Uh, that is the mnemonic is hints there are three eyes that's the only thing but three eyes to you guys is probably something you remember anyhow because of our implant uh, training so hints hereditary or developmental infective inflammatory immune are the three eyes neoplastic traumatic or systemic or if you can't think of a mnemonic just think about the tissue layers that are there you know if you've got something affecting the palate then you've got epithelium you've got connective tissue You've got neuro, nerve, nerve tissue and vascular tissue uh, in the palate due to the greater palatine structure. So you might be dealing with a nerve lesion, a, a vascular lesion or something like that. Or you may be dealing with something related to the bone or the, the antra above. Um, so genetic. Um, the obvious one is HEF, hereditary gingival fibromatosis. The textbooks uh we'll say we'll present maxillary tuberosities and mandibular retromolar regions remember um that's rubbish uh they tend it tends to affect the anterior gingiva in fact 
This is Danny, who was uh, 14 years of age. I've covered his face, quite a confident lad, as you can tell by the earrings. Attended with mum and younger brother. Um, and his complaint was that he was having difficulty pulling girls at school at the, at the age of 13. That was genuinely his complaint. When I asked him why, he said, because my friends call me Gummy, and that's why they called him Gummy. And it was having quite a big psychological impact on him. His little brother was sniggering in the corner when he, when he was explaining this to me. And HGF is, in fact, a mutation in the son of Sevenus gene. There are two, SS, son of Sevenus 1 and son of Sevenus 2. Tom Hart in, uh, in Texas uh, really uh, mapped that genetic defect. He's a periodontist, as you know, um, and found out where the mutation was. Pretty useless for us, but, but it's good to know that the etiology is known. And in HGF, really, that is a condition that you're going to have to manage surgically um, and I'm sure you know how to do that. The interesting thing with Danny was that his, um, so I'll go back one, uh, I, his mother also suffered from the condition but was scared of dentists and I got his little brother in the chair who was seven and uh, he had the same condition. So um, Danny was sniggering the, in the corner of the surgery when, uh, when I identified it with his younger brother. There's always a nice end to a tale like this. This was about 15 years ago. Um, I reviewed Danny um, about six months ago, and he just returned from three tours of Af Afghanistan and had three children. Uh, so he clearly did pull uh, a girl at the end uh, when, once we dealt with his HGF. Which leads me on to um, another developmental condition and a very unpleasant condition and very, very rare. And, and, and I'm not showing you this because it's rare. I'm showing you this just to make the point that we can have a massive impact on somebody's um, life and on somebody's um, quality of life and and this is uh, Sham who was my favorite ever patient he sadly died a couple of years ago um, but let me just tell you the story to Sham he suffered from a very rare condition called um, juvenile hyaline fibromatosis um, and what happens is um, it, it's got a sister condition infantile systemic hyalinosis which is even worse they don't survive beyond two so his younger brother died before he's two years of age but they develop a sort of a cartilaginous um, thickening of their skin, mucosal membranes throughout the entire body. And you can see the severe overgrowth that he really presented with. He couldn't eat, he was wheelchair bound, and he was literally dying of weight loss, um, which is why he was referred to me. They develop these sort of uh, nodular lesions, uh, they develop osteolytic bone changes to their, their fingers and toes. They essentially scar up, um, which is why he was in a, a wheelchair. Um, so this is his palate. Um, you can't really see the teeth. Um, that's the histology. You get this sort of very thick cartilaginous tissue. Uh, those were his fingers showing you the, uh, the contractures in the joints and the pigmentation. Tumors on his ears, operated on by ENT surgeons many times. Um, and that's what you have to work with. Um, and so in his case, I said to him, you know, what are your expectations of treatment? And his expectation or his, his perfect outcome to treatment was to be able to eat pizza on his 21st birthday. He was 20 at the time. So I took a very simple approach to him. He had no labial sulcus because of the, the, the sort of uh, the condition itself. And so you've got to slide the needle into his, between his lip and his gingivae. It's very unpleasant. It's like injecting into cardboard, uh, very painful, but he, he got used to it over many, many years. And um, I was able just to simply debulk uh, the anterior teeth first, the lower anterior teeth, and then we did the maxillary uh, anterior teeth at a separate procedure. And as he got used to it, we did more and more and we uncovered his posterior teeth. And you, you're often doing blind surgery here, so you need to be very, very careful um, because you can't, that, that was the limit of his mouth opening. But he ate pizza on his 21st birthday um, and he used to get on the phone and call me uh, and request appointments. He'd come in his wheelchair, and this is him about six months before we lost him. He died from a, from a, a myocardial infarction. Um, and what really touched me with this guy, he was he 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 was an incredibly um, incredibly how can I put it um, inspirational young guy. He worked for the local hospice and composed music for them, and he won a national award for you know um, his personality and all he did for charity. This is his opening, so not easy to operate on this. You need late knives to get in here. 
Um, but actually, his father called me, called me when when he was admitted to hospital with the MI, and, and he wanted me to go into the QE and speak to him. Um, and unfortunately, I uh, I was I wasn't in Birmingham at the time, and and I was quite touched by this. And I said to his dad, well, "Why does he want me to come in?" His dad was very emotional, and he said, "Well, because he's not going to make it through the night, and he knows it, and he just wanted to say thank you um, for everything you did." So there you go. Sorry, I still get quite emotional about this guy. Um, we can have a massive impact on people's quality of life, and and sometimes we don't uh, we don't really recognise it. Okay, different condition, a developmental condition, and and this was a kind of a, a, an experiment, if you like, um, because this young lad, uh, a delightful lad, was a teenager, and he'd been referred in with this granulomatous kind of swelling on his on his anterior teeth, and he's got this sort of uh, groove in his enamel, as you can see, and he already had a, a diagnosis of a condition called sebaceous nevus, which is a, a hamartomatous condition. And um, what happens is that during during sort of um, early years of life, you get these sebaceous glands that migrate along embryological lines. They're called lines of Blaschko, uh, and he had this sort of midline condition. If I show you his his face, uh, you can see here. And he was quite relaxed, quite comfortable with this. He has his own website uh, called scarface.com because he's grown up with this since being a baby. And uh, there's a big debate in the uh, in the uh, dermatology community as to whether this is a um, a connective tissue, a mesenchymal or an ectodermal uh, condition. And so I said to him, well, look, you know, there's not a lot I can do for you, but if you're willing for me to numb the area up and raise a flap, I'll see where this in our groove goes and we'll be able to answer a a question for the dermatologist as to whether it's ectodermal or mesodermal. So he said, yeah, sure, go ahead, you know, numb me up and let's have a look. So we did. And uh, you can see here the groove kind of meanders around the enamel and then comes back up and it doesn't go onto the root dentine at all. Uh, so we were able to solve the problem. Uh, it's an ectodermal condition and it's not a, um, it's not a, 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 a mesenchymal, a mesodermal condition. And this is him sewn up. This is him as a baby. Uh, from the children's hospital where the lesion was a lot bigger. He was operated on by plastic surgeons at the time. You can see uh, it affected his tongue and, and his chin. And uh, this is probably the cutest baby I think I've ever seen. This is him as a baby. I do have permission for the images, but obviously I'd be grateful if you'd treat these with respect um, and, and don't really share them. Okay, papillon Lefebvre syndrome. Um, so uh, it's genetic, it's autosomal recessive. Um, consanguinity in parents is, is very common. Um, it's caused by a mutation. Marlin Thakar was the first to really uh, uh, identify the mutation on the um, uh, long arm of chromosome 11. There are probably over 50 of these mutations described now. Um, it's a defect in cathepsin C, which is an enzyme that's uh, important as an antimicrobial because it activates something called um, catholicidin and forms something called LL37. And LL37 is, is an antimicrobial peptide. So everybody has traditionally thought that papillon Lefebvre syndrome patients lose their teeth because they can't fight infection. Uh, I'll dispel that rumor, that rumor in a minute. Um, and it's quite rare, prevalence of one to four per million people. So this is one of those systemic diseases that will present as a periodontitis. So it's periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. Um, and you get this sort of palmar plantar keratoderma, uh, the aggressive prepubertal periodontitis. Uh, they sometimes get skin infections and liver abscesses, but that's quite rare. They normally lose their teeth before 18 years of age. It's quite a devastating condition, actually, for teenagers. I have six families uh, in Birmingham. Uh, and it's been tough taking them from three years of age. They're now in their sort of late teens. Um, a deciduous clearance is sometimes a good idea and use of systemic antibiotics to get rid of AA from their, from their mouth. And uh, we did try these patients on retinoids. Acetretin uh, does, um, there are sort of uh, retinoid response elements on the promoter region of the gene where the defect is, but I'll be honest, it clears the skin, but we found no particularly brilliant effect on the on the aggressive periodontitis and the tooth loss. So this is a young four-year-old at presentation. You can see the deciduous teeth here and the recession. He's Indo-Pakistani, sorry, he was three, 
consanguineous parents. They were um, they were cousins, first cousins. He had mobility of his lower deciduous incisors, and his father was edentulous by the age of 18. Uh, his parents didn't know what the diagnosis was. All I had to do was look at his hands, and he's got the the keratosis here, and it was a fairly easy diagnosis to make. Those are his feet, um, and that's his dad, his hands, and uh, sorry if you're eating your tea, those are his feet. He's got a more severe form. Um, so quite a devastating condition. This is a different patient, but you can see again this very, very aggressive prepubertal periodontitis uh, presenting uh, as a manifestation of the papillon Lefebvre syndrome. Um, we did some work on this. Um, this is another seven-year-old. And what we were able to show was, as a result of the cathepsin C deficiency, a multitude of neutrophil defects. And I won't bore you with the details, other than to say that what happens is that the neutrophil chemotaxis is not switched off in these patients. So they don't produce nets, neutrophil nets, to kill bacteria. They don't produce the active LL37 to kill the bacteria. And so you've got this sort of constant stimulus and the neutrophils come into the tissues. And because of the lack of inactivation of something called MYP1 alpha, which is a chemoattractant, and also their neutrophils produce bucket loads of, of interleukin-8. They're very, they produce a lot of cytokines, these neutrophils, excessive cytokine production and excessive oxygen radical production. So what happens is the neutrophils are recruited into the tissues. They, um, they have defective chemotaxis, so they, they kind of wander around the tissues, uh, not chemotaxing properly, releasing lots of oxygen radicals, lots of cytokines, and they basically destroy the tissues. So what you have in papillon Lefebvre syndrome is a very severe inflammation and a destruction that's host mediated. And it's not necessarily the bugs themselves and failure to clear the bugs. It's more the relentless recruitment of the neutrophils. And if you want to read more about it, this was the, uh, a paper we published in a journal called the Journal of Leukocyte Biology. Um, and it was back in 2016 where we sort of describe all of these defects. Uh, it's Mendelian inheritance, so, um, and because it's recessive, um, this is his, in fact, family tree. Um, mother was heterozygous for the mutation, dad was homozygous, so um, two out of the four kids will essentially um, be affected, and two will be carriers, if you like, um, or heterozygotes. He was the unlucky one. Um, there's a big debate at the moment with hay monk syndrome as to whether it's just the other end of the spectrum of papillon affair syndrome. And I say that because um, if you regard it as a slide rule, on the left hand side, you can get the keratoderma without any periodontitis. Uh, as you move along the spectrum, you can get the periodontitis. That would then be papillon affair syndrome. And if you get skin abscesses, significant infections of the skin and liver abs abscesses, it may actually be Hay-Monk syndrome. And actually the mutations in Hay-Monk syndrome are the same as in papillon Lefebvre syndrome. So they're probably part of the same spectrum. So with Hay-Monk, you just have the abscesses in addition to the aggressive periodontitis. Uh, and again, that's the theory we put across uh, a couple of years ago in a publication. I'm gonna speed up because uh, I'm, I'm conscious I've only got five minutes or so left. So childhood viruses, I'm not gonna teach you how to suck eggs. You know all about childhood viruses. The ones that I want to flag, uh, this is hand, foot and mouth, which is a Coxsackie virus. This is um, primary hepatic gingival stomatitis. But molluscum uh, is one I just want to mention. It can present with these sort of leafy viral warts on the gingivae. Um, you normally would get with molluscum contagiosum, you'd get skin lesions and they look like little, uh, tiny little donuts, as you can see here. Uh, apparently one in five kids below the age of two will present with one of these at some point in their lives. Um, they, it's called contagiosum because they, they disappear after a week, they become inflamed and heal up, and then another one appears next to it. Um, and basically they're very diff difficult to manage. Normally you treat viral warts with cryosurgery, a, a liquid nitrogen probe, three sort of visits should see the warts off. Um, but you can't do that in kids because they're incredibly painful. You've just got to allow them to see their course through. And as the kid's immune system sort of matures over the first few years of life, they will gradually disappear. But it's important to reassure parents that it can take two and a half years before they disappear. That's a long time to wait. 
when they've got disfiguring lesions like this, but, uh, but um, that's just the way it is. Fungal infections, candidosis you're familiar with, there are deep mycoses, this is histoplasma capsulatum, it's a very immunosuppressed child who sadly died from a severe immune deficiency, looks like an NUG, um, they're in the operating table here and I've had to take the teeth out and biopsy because it wasn't an, M an NUG, uh, this was uh, histoplasmosis and it came from the biopsy. Inflammatory lesions, uh, this is um, a young patient who presented at seven years of age, um, paralyzed from the waist down, and the neurosurgeons referred him because he had these multiple oral lesions and they wondered if it was related. I won't go into the full details of the case, but these are pyogenic granulomas and he has multiple of them. They're everywhere, quite a neglected child, um, as you can see. Um, and these were managed surgically under a general anaesthetic, I took the wisdom teeth out, did the surgery, sent the tissue off for biopsy and, and what the biopsy came back with was disseminated or multiple pyogenic granulomas. Now the neurosurgeons were chuffed to bits because he had a space occupying lesion in spinal cord. And if I show you his MRI scan, this is the MRI scan, you can see here there is a space occupying lesion. And uh, they didn't want to go in and biopsy the spinal cord for obvious reasons, could have led to paralysis. Um, and our diagnosis, our histology, uh, led them to treating him with physiotherapy to compress this syrinx. Um, Syringa mylie is what they call it. It's a, a sort of a, a cyst-like enlargement in the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that conservative treatment, he was out of his wheelchair in about three weeks and running around like a normal kid. So. Um, the mouth is easily accessible and sometimes our diagnosis is, uh, is easier than it is for a neurosurgeon. This is the lady with the C1S rays deficiency I told you about at the beginning of the presentation and these are the gingivae and her history was she was 38 years of age and every time she got stressed her gingival tissue swelled up with a fluid type swelling and then the swelling didn't go down and she'd been managed for 21 years by radical surgery. Um, and suffice to say, I did every blood test under the sun for her uh, to try and avoid having to operate on her every four or five months. Uh, and everything came back negative apart from the C1 esterase. And in fact, her levels were normal. Her C1 esterase inhibitor levels were normal, but in fact, the activity was low. And so she basically wasn't switching off the complement activation. We tried every drug under the sun, working with the clinical immunologists, including C1 inhibitor infusions. We had her on anabolic steroids, on uh, systemic steroids, uh, corticosteroids, that is. Nothing would manage this. And we ended up just having to operate on her and do some fairly unpleasant, unpleasant debulking surgery about every four or five months. So she would get on the phone in discomfort. This is what she looked like. And you just have to go in and raise an inverse bevel flap modified Widman type approach, and then debulk the tissues by literally filleting this lot out, uh, collapsing everything down uh, to eliminate the false pocketing. And she was chuffed to bits at these operations. She was much more comfortable afterwards and quite, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite grateful. Immunological, so we're still on hints. We're on the third eye now. Uh, plasma cell gingivitis, here again, anatomically beyond the mucogingival line, sort of a stippled granular red appearance, um, biopsy above the gingivae. Um, this can be a difficult condition to manage uh, because it's generally due to an allergic reaction. She was, a, this particular patient was allergic to a preservative in cleaning agents. Uh, she ended up with a laryngitis uh, and losing her voice and also having difficulty breathing. And so the NT surgeons got in touch not wanting to biopsy her vocal cord and said, you know, Ian, you've been managing this girl, what, what's going on? And I said, well, she's got a plasma cell mucositis. In your case, uh, stick her back on the corticosteroids. And they did, and her voice cleared up and she was able to breathe normally. But she's on long-term corticosteroids because we, she was actually allergic to something called sodium metabisulfate, and we couldn't eliminate that from her lifestyle, really. It's in virtually every household cleaning agent that people use. Neoplasia, um, I've listed a few here just to show you some examples. This is um, the important thing if you suspect malignancy, if you've got an ulcerated lesion, is to feel it. And if it feels hard or rubbery hard, that should raise alarm bells. 
and you should do an incisional biopsy, leave it behind, take a piece out of it and see what the histopath comes back with. That's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but it can also affect the gingival tissues. This is also, where is it? That's also non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Again, feel it, it feels rubbery hard, indurated. Uh, take your biopsy up here um, and then refer obviously for uh, treatment. This is leukemia. This is a patient where we have gingival enlargement due to um, acute myeloid leukemia, infiltration of the tissues with the leukemic cells. And this is a squamous cell carcinoma arising in a patient with erosive lichen planus. Again, uh, very rubbery hard margins, uh, not, not pleasant. This one is really important and it's one of the last cases I'm gonna share with you, but this patient um, was referred by a local dental practitioner. He's a really good local dental practitioner, quite high up in the community, uh, because he'd excised the epulis nine months previously um, and it had come back and he was concerned that there was something odd going on here. And clearly there is something going on because again, beyond the mucogingival line, it's quite injected, it's starting to break down. This is sort of looking a bit necrotic and purpley. And when I felt it, it was absolutely rubbery hard. And if you look at the palate here, there's obviously expansion and there's breakdown and necrosis in the palate. So my question to him on the phone was, well, what did your histopathology show when you biopsied this patient the first time nine months ago? And he went very quiet. And the reason he went very quiet was he hadn't sent the tissue for histopath. Uh, and it came back as a chondrosarcoma. And it was right up to the base of this guy's skull. And this guy is a colleague of mine. He's a physicist in the university. That's the periapical radiographs. You can see it's moth-eaten bone loss here. And uh, the prognosis is very, very poor for, um, for this chap. He's had some fairly aggressive surgery. The MaxFax team have taken his maxilla out, put a rig graft in, and this is his reconstruction. We're doing a simplant reconstruction here to try and um, rebuild that side of his maxilla. But really the salutary tale here is, I don't care if it looks like an epulis, it might look completely benign. You may have seen it a hundred times before, but if you're gonna biopsy it, you must send that tissue off to pathology because you just don't know what might be underlying it. Traumatic lesions, we're almost there now. This is self-abuse. This is a child scratching away at the gingivae. We call it um, um, gingivitis artifacta. Uh, this is an older patient, a teenage female, who exfoliated her lower right canine. She's causing traumatic attachment loss here. You can see the keratosis from the, the chronic kind of irritation. Uh, and the way to sort of pick this up is to ask the patient to point to the area and the fingernail goes straight to it. Or if you disclose the tooth, you'll find no plaque on that tooth because it's all being scratched away. Um, this lad, so clearly you're dealing with a psychology or a psychiatric problem here. This lad had... Uh, obsessive compulsive disease uh, disorder. He attacked his, his ginger with a, with, um, with a knife, uh, scissors, sorry, a pair of scissors all the time. He was referred to me by a psychiatrist who uh, wanted him, uh, wanted to see if I could treat this. Uh, I said, well, not a cat and health chance unless you tell me he is stable. And he guaranteed he was stable. So I did a connective tissue graft. And this lad came into the surgery a week later, looking very shameful with his head hung low and said, I've been naughty, I've, I've, I've had a go at the graft uh, with scissors. So um, the graft partially survived. He wanted it doing again, and I said, no, um, come back in a year. If you've got rid of your psychiatrist and you're off the drugs, I might do a laterally repositioned flap because that might work now we've got some decent thick tissue. He came back after a year. He'd seen, he, he got rid of his psychiatrist. I had confirmed that by speaking to the psychiatrist and he was off the drugs. So I did the laterally repositioned flap. And he came back a week later, having attacked his incised legs with the, with the scissors to avoid the gingivae. Uh, his gingivae were perfect. He was happy um, and it dealt with his OCD. So um, there you go. That's the psychiatric side of life because we see these cases all the time. But if there's no plaque there uh, and you think it's been caused by a different reason, then don't do the surgery. Uh, we can do the surgery. We can cover those types of lesions. But if there's an underlying psychiatric condition, Think about how that's managed first. And then this is just a giant cell uh, granuloma around a couple of implants just for the metabolic lesions um, to finish off really. So there we are, we are. it's been, uh, I've probably been almost an hour and a half, I apologize. Our building closes in about 10 minutes, so, well, five minutes. So 
I'll take some questions, but if you want to read more, uh, those are my conclusions. It's a big subject. Hopefully you've got a feel for it. Uh, clearly never treat medical pr problems surgically. That's a key, key message from today. Avoid gingival biopsies, another key message from today. Consider multiple pathology and interpret your special investigations with, uh, with care. And um, if you want to read more about it, here's a shameless promotion of the quintessence book we wrote a number of years ago. Sadly, it's out of print. <laughs> Uh, but you might find it in a library. Um, but the Germans have produced one. If you're into German, they translated it into German. So uh, if you speak German, you can still get this book in German. Um, so thank you for listening. And that's that's me. So, um, Imi, I think uh, we've probably got about five minutes for questions, uh, if anybody has any. Brilliant. Yeah, we have got one. Thank you so much for um, sharing all your collection of photos and the histories that you've managed to accumulate over the years. Uh, it's been really interesting to watch. I feel like I've been sitting in an oral medicine revision session <laughs> and a perio revision as well. So um, thank you so much for all your information. Pleasure. Um, we, I do have a question. This is from myself, first of all, just to start. And then we have got one from a um, listener. And then if anyone else has got a question, please do feel free to post them now. Um, you showed us a picture of a 15-year-old girl who'd been using cocaine. Yeah. Um, earlier on in the slide, the lower um, inc incisors and the yeah. lower gingiv anterior gingivae. Um, I was just wondering if you could give me some tips on, you know, being on the receiving end of these referrals, um, and also with the mother in the room, you said it was difficult, but managing um, how you manage the patient and also how you write and communicate with the GP and the general medical practitioners in these situations. Yeah, good question. Uh... So it's really important to have the conversation with, without parents in the room or you won't get the right answers. But obviously you've got to be very sensitive and just say, kind of have a word with your, with your daughter or son or whoever on, on their own, as I said, um, and then agree a strategy so as not to undermine them because at the end of the day, uh, if they're Gillick competent, they can consent to that. Um, and um, most of these kids are Gillick competent. Um, then really it was a case of a confidential referral to her GP uh, to get her referred for support and, and I left it with the GP. I followed her up for a couple of years afterwards. A uh, really nice kid. Um, she, she was, she did have learning difficulties to be honest, but she was at the normal end of the spectrum. So she was Gillick competent, but, but she was quite a challenging young lady to, uh, to persuade to lead a healthier lifestyle, but her GP did it that way and managed managed to get her uh, off the cocaine when I last saw her, at least it was a number of years ago. So it was done through the GP as a confidential referral. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is a question from one of our listeners. I think he's a practitioner, um, a clinician up in Aberdeen. Um, mm. He's written about why is Crohn's disease considered to be classed as one of the major impacts on the loss of periodontal tissues, um, whereas something like diabetes is classed as an other condition which affects the pathogenesis. So they're put into the different ones, either the major impact or the ones that have an influence on the pathogenesis of the disease. And he's, his question really comes that there is a lot less evidence regarding Crohn's, but there's a lot more on diabetes. So how have you decided to class these two separately? I think he's absolutely spot on. And I did not make that decision. And I disagree with that decision. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting uh, that uh, there are a number of conditions in that classification system that I think are misclassified um, personally, because I do a lot of this kind of work. 50% of my practice is this kind of work. And I agree with your, I agree with the, with, with, with the chat from Scotland. Uh, Crohn's, I rarely see bone loss with Crohn's disease. And if I see it, it's periodontitis. And I don't think it's that much more prevalent than, uh, um, than it is in non-Crohn's patients. Uh, whereas diabetes, I would agree, uh, is, um, particularly if it's not well controlled, a significantly greater impact as far as I'm concerned. Um, so all I can do is agree. Um, it's not a perfect <laughs> classification system by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank, well, thank you um, for your feedback on that. I've just got um, another question. So if I was a GDP in practice, and we saw something, you know, that didn't look right with the periodontal tissues, whether it was inflammatory or immune, I was just wondering, have you got any tips for making urgent referrals to a periodontist or to a hospital? Um, I suppose you have to follow normal protocols, but have you got any tips for general general dental practitioners working in practice? 
Sure. So for general practice, dental practitioners, if you, if you don't have um, access to, you know, be able to get bloods and things done, but, but if you have an index of suspicion that's high enough that it, you think it might be a pre-malignancy or a malignancy, then uh, you can make an urgent referral through the two-week um, pathway. So you would refer to, to your local general hospital or your local or medicine department, uh, and you would just state clearly in that referral that you think that there may be uh, a pre-malignancy or a malignancy here, and please could the patient be seen on that um, on that rapid access, it's called a rapid access pathway, uh, and that patient will be booked in and triaged within two weeks. So that, that's the way to approach it, but you've got to have a high index of suspicion, so it must feel odd as well, it must you know, have that sort of malignant, indurated feel to it if it's, if it's a localised lesion. If you think it's just a rare condition, then uh, it's not such an informed an urgent referral uh, it can just go in routinely okay thank you yeah you were saying about the malignant legions often feeling very firm mm. um do they still feel firm i, I, I did an uh, max fax year so i saw um tumors in the floor of the mouth in the retromolar region but if yeah. you had something dodgy over teeth like in the gingival tissues does that still feel firm as well mm. it, it does, does. Probably, firm, yeah. probably firmer than the floor of the mouth or ventral surface of the tongue um yeah. because it's it's a keratinized uh tissue uh, the gingerly yeah. so yeah it does it feels you'll know that it's not normal and then for me when i examine the oral mucosa if i if i see a sinister lesion the first thing i do is feel it and then check if the if the mucosa is, is moving and if it feels soft then i'm 99 percent sure it's nothing to worry about uh, and if the mucosa the surface of mucosa moves over the connective tissue so there's no sort of um tethering at all that sort of confirms that you're probably not dealing with the tumour um, and you've got a bit more time on your hands to get the diagnosis done. Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, we've still got um, 64 people online, so that's very impressive for this time on a uh, Monday evening. And I know, Prof, you've had a busy week, so I will let you go and hopefully get your glass of wine at some point this evening. Um, I just wanted to finish by also saying a huge thank you to our sponsors, Johnson & Johnson. Um, and yeah, Prof Chapel, it's been an inspiration hearing you speak. Thank you so much for, literally, I feel like I've looked through an oral medicine textbook or a periodon for medicine textbook and I've been updated. And thank you so much for all the information you've given us this evening. Pleasure. And thank you for being such a brilliant host. Uh, worked really well. <laughs> it's been good fun. Okay, it's great. Well, thank you very much. Cheers. Fantastic. Bye -bye. Okay. Good night. Bye-bye.